Kings in his career. So, I still do works in university, who has done nothing else apart from the university. And Paul has a uh, trained architect on his own practice, done research and taught at universities, and the uh, regional director of um, health and safety executive in Scotland, Northern England, and the chief executive of the Scottish Standards, Building Standards Agency. So, over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank oh, you. and author of, I was holding it, author of the uh, best-selling book, Five and First Principles, in fourth edition now, so it's doing very well. Thank you, Gavin. Um, this is a nice elite group, so let's do it more as a seminar. Um, if you want to interrupt or ask questions, please do so. I won't be offended. I may disagree with you, I may ignore you, but I won't be offended. Um, we all want buildings to be safer. I don't think there's any dispute about that. Um, but what do we really mean by buildings being safer? Um, people's perception of safety depends dramatically on what they've experienced, and what they've been told is safe, and what they have come to believe is safe. Um, so I'm going to talk about safety in buildings, but with that slight warning about what do we mean by safety. I'm not going to use PowerPoint because everyone uses PowerPoint and is attempted to switch off or read the slide before me. And I'm not going to show you pictures of big fires because I've seen too many fire brigade talks like that. And there's a little bit of the sort of macho size. I've been to a bigger fire than you've had. Uh, more people died here. And I get a little bit uneasy about that as I get older. Um, but let's start with safety. Um, I think there's a distinction between being safe and feeling safe. And the classic example of that is crime. Uh, most people in the country would say they are no longer as they are not as safe as they used to be. This is not such a safe country as it once was. Yet all the evidence, all the statistics point to the fact that we are at an all-time low in crime. Certainly in Scotland, certainly in Great Britain, and certainly in Northern Ireland. And what's more, not only are we at an all-time low for crime, with homicides, housebreaking and the like, we've got more police than we've ever had before, because people feel so unsafe, they want more police. And whether there's any causal relationship between more police and safety is interesting. We've also got far more surveillance, you know, the cameras are everywhere. We are the most surveyed country possibly there is. So there's a big difference there between the fear of crime, the perception of crime, and the reality of it. Now in buildings, strangely, it can work the other way around. We feel totally safe when we're actually at risk. And there is that sort of dichotomy of how do you get people to realise when they're actually at risk. And I'll be coming back to that. I worked in health and safety as the regional director for Northern Britain for four years, until two years ago. And as soon as you say you work for the HSE, people immediately come out with their favourite health and safety story, what they weren't allowed to do. And as I say these words, people will smile, because health and safety is, I won't say what I really think about it because it's been recorded, but health and safety is a phrase that isn't actually terribly helpful any longer. And I got to the stage where if I was in a taxi, and you're talking to the taxi driver on a long drive to sort of one of the more stupid, located airports like East Midlands, what do you do? I wouldn't say that I was originally director of HSE, I'd say that I, I led a team that, in first, that was forensic workplace death investigators. And they say, gosh. And I say, yeah, we do all that CSI stuff, but I'm one of those people who die in the workplace. And they got really interesting. And they got really excited about it. Because that is what we actually did most of the time, was looking at why people died in the workplace. But if you talk about health and safety, the public perception, you know, You've all heard the one about conkers being banned in primary schools. It isn't true, actually. The urban myth has been traced. We had staff who worked in our boot head office who traced the urban myths. Um, I was asked, and I actually challenged in uh, the page of the Scotsman, sword dancing, because I was told we had banned sword dancing at Highland Games. Um, we hadn't, and if you've ever seen the swords they use for Highland Games, you realise they're sort of little bendy bits of uh, very soft metal, which is not an edge on at all, and you can, you know, they're like sort of um, tin foil that you can cook with. Um, 
I was accused of, well, sorry, not I personally, but HSE was accused of stopping home baking sales in churches. We were, stopped, we were accused of stopping the fancy dress parade in Jedburgh. Um, and we were accused of stopping people clearing snow outside their own houses about three winters ago because that was too dangerous. Nothing to do with us. And in that one, I wrote to every single newspaper in Scotland and appeared on television and uh, drive time on uh, BBC Scotland Time, saying, no, you can clear it. It's okay, you can clear it. It's no problem. So there's a perception that's wrong. There's a sort of what I would call a Jeremy Clarkson mentality, that if it's health and safety, it's awful and stopping us doing that. But the reality is there are things that are dangerous when you've got this reverse problem. So, what are the most dangerous occupations in Scotland? As this is a small group, I'll throw it in. Who would like to suggest what is the most dangerous occupation in terms of death in Scotland? Yeah? No. Builders? No. Working on a platform? No. Farmers? Yes. Farming is far and away the most dangerous occupation in Scotland. About 10 to 20 farmers every year die. Far more than die in construction, far more than die on oil platforms if you exclude helicopter crashes. Helicopters are rather a specialised problem area and they tend to kill a lot when they go down. Sorry, it was right, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I will ignore you. You can speak, but it doesn't mean you're going to take serious. Um, but farming is really dangerous, and it's dangerous for a number of reasons, one of which is people work alone often, so they die horribly because they, they get uh, trapped by a piece of machinery and bleed to death, or they get trodden on by a cow, and they crawl to the gate and die there 12 hours later. So farming is a Second, someone actually said it was construction. That is still dangerous, unfortunately. And the third is waste and recycling. The number of people killed by waste and recycling is quite worrying. And in fact, all this business about recycling, so you now don't have one bin collection, we have three or four a week, multiplies the number who die by about three or four. Because what people are killed by are the lorries, reversing, turning, not looking. So you've actually seen a rise in the number of killed by recycling and waste. Also, one or two people who sleep in those big bins, which isn't a good thing to do, and a couple of people every year die. So, this reality is quite different. And for the point of view of HSE, the sorts of things we were involved in was looking at those sorts of activities. The investigations of the farm deaths, the investigation of the construction deaths, and less frequently, the investigation of the really serious ones that catch the headlines. Because one of the problems about safety is you don't normally get television coverage or news coverage for one death. You get it for four, you probably get it for two or three. But to get coverage for one, it's got to be unusual. So a policeman or a fire. So those are the sorts of issues. Um, probably the largest number of deaths that we investigated uh, in my time. Would anyone like to guess that in Scotland? I'm talking about the last six years. The C. difficile outbreak at the Vale of Heathen Hospital which killed at least 18, and possibly more. They, weren't, they didn't die at work because they were patients, but they were killed by a work activity because the way they were being looked after was not sufficiently careful and planned and programmed. And that was a major investigation for us, and as you're aware, there was a public inquiry afterwards. So, I would like to pose a hypothesis for the rest of my chat this afternoon. That an overemphasis on simple prescriptive safety requirements without understanding the limitations, the background, the fears, the perceptions, and their understanding of why things are done actually is counterproductive. And you see it in the health and safety because people don't like that phrase and laugh at you You possibly see it a little bit in fire safety come onto this, because people associate fire safety with things like a smoke detector going off at home. And it's a real nuisance because you can't get the batteries and the battery backup has failed and it's tweeting all night. So you actually take the batteries out or even if you're really annoyed, you rip it off the ceiling. 
and you lose it. You don't understand the relationship between the hardware and the function of the files. So, fire safety, health and safety, is the same true perhaps of other things? I think it might well be true of crime, as I said earlier, but it might also be true of things like healthy eating, global warming. We get so caught up with the repetitive, simplistic, prescriptive answers that we stop understanding the real issues. And sometimes, dumbing it down to the prescriptive statements actually can be counterproductive. And I'm not going to go into that, but I just wonder, you know, if you, if you talk to my children about what they most remember about school assemblies, and I've done this, they say there are two things we always had. One was road safety, and the other one was healthy eating. The consequence of the healthy eating means that neither of them like vegetables, because it's been driven in and driven in and driven in five a day, and they will have lengthy arguments with me about what the five are and what, what's a vegetable. But it hasn't actually achieved the desired effect because it became too simplistic and too prescriptive. So, let's turn to fire safety and let's look at some simple things um, that people encounter. But actually, I think, harm position door closers. Lots of people encounter door closers. And what do they do? They wedge the door open. One of the most influential experiences of my life when I first worked on fire back in very early 80s was the Kakadi Nursing Home Fire, which was in 1982, just across. And I can remember attending the, in, the fatal accident inquiry and seeing the interrogation of the joiner who had cut the wedge for the fire door. And he was being taken to pieces by a QC. And it wasn't pleasant to watch because this poor guy had cut some wedges, as he'd been requested to do, by someone far higher up the food chain. But he was the one who ended up being blamed for the fact that one nurse had died and four or five others were seriously injured. That wasn't the real reason for the fire, but it was part of the fact of one's specified story. So door closers, people don't believe they're necessary because they haven't experienced it. The number of flats that people will actually say, um, there are door closers around the staircase, but they're not necessarily so we'll have them off, we'll take them away. So you have to ask the question, if they're going to be overridden, should they be there in the first place? I annoy my wife sometimes in going around, if I'm going around a building like this one, like this museum, if I see a door closer, you know, a wedge, under a door that keeps open, keep the door open a wedge, I'll pick it up and put it in my pocket. She says, you can't do that. And I said, well, if they come and challenge me, I'll, I'll have an interesting discussion with them. <laughs> but I don't think they'll want to sort of object too strongly. Another thing you get fed up with, and which lowers the perception of safety, is the signs. You know, it's not too bad in a building like this, because it's a well-designed building, and the signage has been thought about. But you get the other extremes, where I was involved when I worked for the Scottish Government in doing the HMO legislation, and the desire to put signs in HMOs. Now, some of you have been students living in an HMO. How's it multiple occupations? Sorry, if you don't know it. Um, this is people's home, people's homes. Do you therefore need a sign over the front door saying exit? The argument being you should, because somehow it makes it safer. How does it make it safer if it's the door I go in and out of? And then the other extreme, um, trying to get effective signage in something like IKEA, which will be revolved in a very long argument with IKEA out in, uh, in Midlothian. Because how do you actually sign the ways out of IKEA for a store that is deliberately designed to get you to go around everywhere? They really don't want you taking shortcuts. So they really don't want the fire signage to actually show people quickly ways out. So you've got a problem. And it's a classic example where the signage there probably doesn't work as well as it should do. Next time you go to IKEA, have a look. Um, I was involved in a shopping centre in the English Midlands where we came with a much simpler compromise. We wouldn't have signs in the conventional sense, but we would have large floodlights that came on and floodlit the exit routes in the event of a fire. So you go for some alternative to the thing that just says uh, the green or any man. Um, in 
a similar thing, the, the issue about alarms, people get so conditioned to alarms that they don't actually necessarily take them seriously. I'm sure you've all been in somewhere like Sainsbury's or Tesco's when you've heard an alarm go off. I don't know what you do, but I tend to ask the staff, why has an alarm gone off? They often say, oh, it's nothing you need to worry about. And I say, well, I'd just like to know what the alarm is for. And sometimes it's because the freezers have got too warm. Or sometimes it's because someone's gone into the cash office, that's fine. But knowing how fast fire can spread, and knowing how many people have died in major shop fires, if that is a fire in uh, their <coughs> Tesco's or wherever, I want to know, because I want to start running away. And I don't want someone reassuring me, oh, it's not a problem, it often happens. You get this problem of familiarity, and the trivial reads a degree of contempt. I, can I yeah. interrupt? I think also what you you tie to the perception of how safe you are. Uh, as a father, if I'm with my kids, any alarm I will move towards the exit. If I'm alone, it will not be the same reaction. But at the end of the day, in big, uh, in big, uh, let's say facilities, having a lot of people, even if you're a single man, you can be caught, and uh, the consequences will be the same. So, so so ties to. I remember having the alarm in, a, in my building with my kids. I mean, it's, we went out, it was in the US, it was very cold, we didn't even grab a coat because the kids were new here. I was staying in a, um, a remote, remote um, residential institution in the Hebrides, and the fire alarm went off in the night. So I got up and went downstairs. No one else did. After five minutes, I met the maintenance guy trying to silence it. But no one else. And it was a false alarm. But next morning at breakfast, someone said to me, did you hear the false alarm in the night? They could not have known that was a false alarm. <laughs> but that, at those days, there was no retained fire appliance on the island. There was a pump that they connected behind the Land Rover, which drove around. That was the chances of it. So it's perception. But it, you're quite right. It does depend on who you're with. Some of you will know the terrible story of the fire in Woolworths in Manchester, and of I think about eight or nine people who died. And a number of those just did not appreciate the speed of fire spread, and they were in the canteen or the restaurant, as they call it now in Woolworths. Woolworths have gone, of course, but they, went, they died because they chose to finish their meal. They didn't realize the need to go quickly. Uh, and it was reckoned that you had about two minutes between the fire being spotted and the floor being untenable. So, domestic situations, you've got problems, people get familiar with alarms which don't work at home, they get familiar with door closers which annoy them, uh, they come to signs which perhaps they don't recognise. So there's a general sort of feeling that this isn't my concern, this isn't a problem. So how do you actually get an awareness uh, that there is something which you have to do. I'll give you one example which I was involved in when I was in practice, was doing, and some of you may have heard said before, we were involved in a number of nightclubs. And you've got a situation where you've got, uh, one of them I think was licensed for 800 and the other was licensed for well over 1,000. How do you make people in the nightclub with lots of noise, lots of alcohol, uh, lots of lights, aware that it's fun? And what we agreed with the owners, and eventually they were accepted by the Northern, Fire, uh, Northern Ireland Fire Brigade, is they would put all the lights off. Sorry, they put all the sound system off and all the lights on. So it went quiet. And all the lights came on, and that was the shock factor which was agreed. And at the same time, all the turnstiles, this place had turnstiles to get in, to limit the numbers, the turnstiles would be released, and the bars would have to stop selling drinks. But that was to try and create this shock effect. So that's in, that's in simple buildings. Um, another thing that I, I also think gives a false impression of safety in simple buildings, but also in larger buildings, is extinguishers. In that HMO guidance that I talked about, uh, I lost the argument and we required the installation of extinguishers. And as some of you know, I do not believe in fire extinguishers, except fire blankets, because I think they're more hard. 
on their views. And you should not be giving people the false impression that if there is a fire, I can solve that with that red, red tin that's fixed up in the kitchen, which I've never touched before, but that will somehow save me if there's a fire. And that's a, a myth that I'm, I think actually adds to the problem. So you've got a situation in simple buildings where people are being misled by simple <coughs> prescriptive requirements, which I don't think actually add to the safety, the signs, the door closes, the like. When you come to complex buildings, it gets much more interesting because you now have a group of people in the general public who believe they're going to be safe. If you come into a museum like this, you do not believe you are going to be under threat. If you go into John Lewis's, you do not believe you're under any threat. And you assume it's going to be safe for you. Almost every time it will be. The difficulty is on the one occasion where it is not. And in designing for fire safety, you are always designing for the one occasion when 28 unlikely things happen at the same time. Where you've got some sort of faultry analysis where that went wrong and that went wrong. And that one. Uh, some of you will remember the Channel Tunnel fire, where about four safety systems failed. And because they failed in sequence, you got a major fire. The fact that the fifth safety system held and worked was a, a proof of the value of strength and depth. Um, but it is the unlikely things coming together. So, how do you actually produce a complex building? where people are going to expect to be safe and they're just not going to think about safety. They're just going to And the answer to that, I think, is about starting from a first principles approach. You have to look at fire uh, and holistically, not as something you add on when you've designed the building, whether it's a museum or it's John Lewis's or a hotel, but something about you think about from the beginning of the process and bring through the design. And I want to take three examples for you. Uh, there are areas where we worked a lot when in practice. Uh, first of all is hospitals. You do not expect to die in a fire in a hospital. People will die in hospitals and they're dying all the time. But it would be regarded as an absolute scandal if Edinburgh Royal Infirmary burned down. Uh, we were fire engineers on the unsuccessful bit for the ERI, so I can comment on that one. That wasn't the one we did. Um, but hospitals are really, really dangerous places for fire because you have a lot of people who are very ill and very immobile. You have people who have never been there before, who don't know the way around the building, have only gone to one ward. You've got people who are being deliberately sedated. You've got people with mental illness problems. You've got a huge workforce that is changing continually. You possibly have arsonists particularly if you have uh, a mental health unit attached to it who may want to burn it down. <coughs> one of the more interesting tasks we did was working on um, one or two of the secure mental health facilities where we knew there were arsonists and it was almost sort of, can we work out what they're going to do to try and work anyway. So, what do you do? And it's very simple. Uh, when we wrote the guidance for new hospital building, we reduced it to two simple principles. You don't build bonfires. So you do not put the high life risk on top of the high fuel risk. You separate them. And you ensure that they're not together. And I can think of hospitals which there has been done, and I can think of a lot of hospitals where we got involved in, where you actually have done the reverse. You've put the high life risk on top of the high fuel risk or the high fire risk. I can remember one particular uh, client who wanted to employ John and I, uh, and we refused to work for them for a particular hospital <coughs> because that is exactly what they were going to do. They were going to put uh, general ward units over the estates department. And we said, no, we don't want to be involved in this one because it's not safe construction. So you don't build bonfires and you look at what is the high life risk, the high fuel risk, the high uh, ignition risk, and you separate them. In separating them, it probably means you're building low rise. And that's the concomitant of that. And the idea is you building multi-storey hospitals, seven, eight, nine storeys, intrinsically worries me for this. 
uh, and certainly we tended to be favour only one, two, or three stories. The other reason, and the other great principle, is progressive horizontal evacuation. Because people are immobile or have difficulty, you want to move them horizontally, not down. And you want to move them away from the seat of the fire. So if you're going to have to push beds, you push beds on the flat. You do not attempt to take them downstairs. Or, as I have seen in a number of hospitals in the UK and certainly abroad, you install incredibly expensive bed evacuation lifts. And I can think of one hospital in the southwest of England which has six of those to keep their tower box functioning, which can move an entire bed and have the backup fire supply and have been tested by the fire brigade. And in theory, they will evacuate those upper floors of a 12, 13 storey building by lift. Serious limitations. So, progressive horizontal evacuation, you move them horizontally and you move them behind the firewalls. So, that's just as I said it should be low rise, they'll have lots of subdivisions. Now, that isn't anything terribly complicated, but it does require you to think about the design of the building at a very early stage. It, it requires you to think about it even before you have chosen the site, because you're looking for a site which is big enough to do that, and you are perhaps not going necessarily for a city centre site with a very tight plan, which is going to force you to go to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 storeys. So you've got those sorts of issues. So that's one example. Um, and we do have fires in hospitals. We are fortunate not having had a really serious one in Britain in our hospital for quite a long time. Um, but we have had a number of fires in care homes, including one which I investigated when I was with HSE in, in Rose Park. Um, and that raised all sorts of questions as well. So it is a real risk. The second example I want to pick up for you is shopping centres. Because we all use those. I was in John Lewis an hour and a half ago. And to get there you have to go through the shopping centre. And shopping centres used to be, I'm not certain they still are because I'm not involved in any at the moment, really major centres of fire engineering initiative design and thought as to how the smoke was going to move, what was going to burn, and where it was going to burn. And in the ones that I was involved in the 80s and 90s, again, bringing it back to its terribly simple principles, you need to have enough space in the map between one shop and the other shop, you're not going to get the fire spreading across the map. You're going to get the fire going up into the roof and then you get the smoke control and the extract systems and all those things, but it doesn't go from the other. And writing the guidance on, uh, this is 15 years ago, on shopping centre design and some of the work that we did, we were expecting the mall to be sterile. But what concerns me about shopping centres now is what is going into the mouths. Not just the cost of coffees, but the other things that are being sold there. And it is the risk of the fire going from the shop unit to what is in the middle of the mouth to the shop unit opposite. It doesn't actually have to begin in the mouth. If it begins in the mouth, it's even more worrying. But that's the first concern, was about the sterility of the mouth and how we lost that. And is that important? And the second thing, again, is about how you provide um, the ability to retreat so that if the mount does become smoke blocked in the area we are, can you go out through the back of the shop unit? So you have to be able to move from every shop unit, not only forwards into the mount, so you can leave that way, which is where people can go. But if the mall is blocked, or if the front of the store is where the fire has begun, can you go back? Now, that's the other big question to me, and those are the two overriding principles. Certainly you want to get the smoke control right, certainly you have to think about design fire sizes and all that sort of thing, but that's for the detailed engineering, the fundamental principles about how far apart things are, and where people are going to move. Shopping centres certainly are designed, or used to be designed, to keep people in. Uh, and the 
desire was to make people as possible shop for as long as they could. Um, but you need to have that way of getting out. I gave you the example of the one in the Midlands where we agreed for spotlights to illuminate the entrances. In that shopping centre, um, it actually has 26 stories of flats on the top of it. And it's particularly dear to my heart because when I was first married, I rented a flat in that town block. And I will not forget on one occasion in the morning meeting the crew of the fire appliance walking along one of the corridors about eight floors up, dragging a hose, lost, because they couldn't find the way out. And they had come in to put out a fire in a refuse chute, because that had refuse chutes that went the full 26 stories. And it was an interesting fire because someone had stuck a Christmas tree down it. And the Christmas tree got stuck and the rubbish had gone on top of it. And then someone had thought, oh, well, let's burn that out. So they poured something in and dropped a match in. And they had a nice fire burning in the refuge chute. And the guys had come and put that out, easy, put the water down there. But they couldn't find the right route back because there were about 18 sets of lifts to get back to where they'd parked their fire appliance. So, a favourite shot. Third one. And this is the one that, that in some ways bothers me the most because I think people just do not appreciate that they may be at risk is airports. <coughs> um, I've never been involved, my practice was never involved in fire safety design in airports, so I can't claim any expertise. But we have had some serious ones. The Dusseldorf Airport fire um, of about just short of 20 years ago, uh, I think left 17 dead. An estimated to cost one billion Deutschmarks, a hugely expensive fire. And a bit like the famous Summerland fire in Britain, it wasn't actually detected by anything in, this, in the uh, airport. It was detected by a taxi driver who happened to notice some smoke coming through, out, from, out from the building and actually talked to someone and called the fire in. It was a significant period of time before the airport fire service were called in, I think 10 or 12 minutes. Um, and if they did, they were no use at all because they'd never actually been trained how to deal with a, a building fire. Uh, and it was a simple fire, but because of the interconnectedness of the spaces, because of the fact that there was enormous security, so you can't go landward or airward sides, because of the worry about terrorism, so that there are a lot of big secure check areas, people could not find their way out. They did not re realise a lot of those who died were in one of the executive lounges who were not aware that there was a fire and thought it was fine. Why should they be bothered? They were elite, privileged, first-class passengers and they died in the Some others of people were in a lift who got into a lift to take it down and the lift delivered them to the fire floor and they were killed when the lift doors opened. The actual cause of the fire was very simple. It, I think it was welding work of some form in a space above one of the ceiling voids and it set fire to some polystyrene insulation which was not supposed to be there, that had been installed illegally. Um, there were attempts, I believe, in Germany to prosecute people uh, in the first part of the century, but they all petered out in 2001, 2002, 2003, uh, because of the difficulty of proving uh, criminal responsibility. But airports bother me, and I worry about that. And while we make them safer and safer from terrorist attack, but only one type of terrorist attack, it's the only one we're thinking about. We are concerned about. I, ha I was actually in Edinburgh Airport about four or five years ago um, when the alarms went off. And I began to head for a fire door, and I was told, I can't go that way. I have to go that way. And I said, well, I don't know where the fire is. Where is it? He said, he didn't know either. But I can't go that way, even though it's the closest fire door. The the main obligation of the staff when the fire alarms went off was to protect the duty free. They were bringing the shutters down to stop people taking the duty free. Well, you've got a plan for that sort of thing. Uh, when we lived in Belfast, it was a classic event. If you want a new pair of shoes, it said, and I certainly have students who did this. <laughs> they were in a shoe shop and their mate would ring up and say there was a, there was a, a bomb plant in the shoe shop. And they would have their new pair of shoes on ready, and they'd just go out. And that's how you got your new pair of shoes. And Certainly that happened in Castle Court a number of times. Um, I don't know any, but there is a problem in looking at it holistically and taking it together and thinking about the simple things. The airport <coughs> have to have a better way of getting people out and making people aware of it. And it's the one that actually I get nervous about. Worrying. So, 
Let me just extract a little bit to anti-terrorist design, because that was something else we did in Northern Ireland quite a bit of, but we don't tend to talk very much about, and certainly not going to talk about buildings. But one of the problems is you design for what has happened in the past. Very few people are thinking about what might happen in the future. So people have driven in Scotland cars into airports, therefore we put bollards on to stop the cars going in. So, uh, because we had worked a lot in Northern Ireland, we knew what the chances were in Northern Ireland, what the solutions were. When there was the major attack in, in Britain in the late 80s and early 90s, you saw completely wrong responses by the police because they did not know. And the classic one was the Harrods bomb, where the police entered the store. The bomb was inside, so it went off. The glass came out, and lots of people were cut, and I think five died, because they'd been pushed out of the building. In Belfast, you would have more liked to keep them in the building, because the blast was going to go outwards. It's an understanding, certainly if you're dealing with bombs, of where the blast is going to be, whether it's going to be inside or outside unless you've made that assumption and you design accordingly. Um, uh, Ireland was slightly easier because in most cases there the bomber wanted to survive. So you were pretty certain that was part of their scenario. You've got a situation where bombers don't want to survive, and that's harder. But look at the Scottish Parliament. They designed that building. Well, possibly designed that building. Um, I criticise Enrico Morales too much, but but I wasn't well. But um, they then said, oh, we forgot the security. We'll have to put the bollards in. Oh, we've got an underground car park. Why would you put an underground car park beneath a parliament when Airy Meade was killed in 1979 because the RA had bombed his car beneath the Palace of Westminster? Everyone knew that underground car parks were not a good idea when there was a risk of attack. But they were one in you created a situation where you search people inside the building, not as you would do in, in Northern Ireland, in a separate building outside the building, so that if the bomb goes off, it only takes up the searching shed, it doesn't take up the entire building. You create an overhang at Holyrood, um, so that it's perfect for someone to park a vehicle beneath, so you can take down the structural columns. It's, it's a classic example of how they haven't thought about that from the beginning. And they then say, oh, we've now got to spend an extra 20, 30, 40 million rectifying because anti-terrorism is so important. Yes, it is. But if you'd thought about it from the beginning, you wouldn't have to spend that extra money because you could have designed it out. Um, so bringing this all together, the complex buildings. You've got to go back to those first principles. And in far, I think you've got two principles, two objectives. You want to stop people from dying, and you want to protect property. They are normally, can both be dealt with in a building. But sometimes, you have to favour the people against the property. Not the duty free in the, in the airport terminal being protected, rather than passengers. Um, I can think of a shopping centre uh, in, uh, in, in Oxford where they did not put in sprinklers because to put them in would actually increase the life risk. So you can get that analysis properly taken on board. And to actually achieve your objective of life safety and property protection, there's, I would argue, five things you've really got to think about. You've got to stop the fire being started in the first place. In this country, the really only natural hazard is probably lightning, which is relatively simple to protect against, except in York Minster, where somehow they found it. Um, the bigger ones, though, are carelessness and, unfortunately, deliberate fire raising or arson. Um, so you've got to prevent the fire starting. Once the fire starts, your second tactic is to make people aware of it and make people aware of it quickly with the information they need. Um, people do not panic. I don't believe people panic. I do think people act quickly in the event of a 
perceived threat. And they often act wrongly because they've been given the wrong information. And that can be perceived to be panic, but I don't think so. I think people will react if they understand. So it's giving people information quickly and the right information. <coughs> um, a classic one of that in the hospitals is you have to give people efficient information to tell them you can't sort of just put a big all up, uh, let's all leave the building now because there's a fire with 2,000 people, 800 of whom are probably in bed and can't move. <coughs> it's not a good idea. So you have to actually have an information system which is telling staff what they have to do and where the fire is. So you have to have quite a sophisticated communication system. In a shopping centre, again, you need a sophisticated communication system because it may not be affecting the whole building and you may want people to move in particular ways. Um, I don't know if John Lewis is still doing it, but John Lewis used to have a coded alarm. You should listen out for this for John Lewis, which was sprinkler testing. They may have changed that. But if they have a fire detected, they announce sprinkler testing. You know, sprinkler testing in the in the homewares department. That means they go to homewares um, because their sprinklers may have gone off because there's a fire. Um, and they then knew their staff knew that if there was sprinkler testing, they had to shuttle everyone out of the building as fast as possible, and some staff would respond to that point. So you can use coded messages as well. Does anyone know if does anyone know if John Lewis is still using that? Oh right. I remember that guy in New York. He used to work in cinema in Northern Ireland, and they they had a code that's like, um, "Can Mr. Black go to reception?" It means there was a bomb threat in like one of the theaters. But, yeah. There's a hospital I know that they had Doctor Red, which I thought was a bit crude. <laughs> Because um, you need to know that, but yeah, you need to have some sort of coding system. But in Northern Ireland, I don't even know Castle Court in Belfast. Well, he's not. I know where Castle Court is. Yeah. Well, we had real problems in getting them to have suitable messages, and in fact, we ended up with things like saying, um, um, "Don't attempt to remove your car from the car park," because when, we did, when there were a number of instances where people were trying to get from the shopping centre to salvage their cars on the attached multi-story car park, but the consequence was that everyone was sitting in their cars uh, with the engines running, <laughs> queuing up to leave. So you have to encourage people to leave without their cars. So you have to actually... Uh, Jen's used to have Mr. Bracken to the chairman's office. Mr. Bracken to the chairman's office? Oh, that's a lovely one. Thank you. We didn't have a chairman at the time. And what were the staff instructed to do? That one was just on alert. And what was the next one? Uh, gosh, I remember. That, well, that was the alert for right. all the people that were actually trained to go and take up their stations. Right. And started to evacuate people from the building. So that was a few warnings. Every place of entertainment has a form of code message to get the front of the house staff to begin their evacuation procedures. Yeah. And same with all concerts, and they're quite consistent across Scotland. Right. So that they know every day if you were in it, you would know. So what should I listen up to? <laughs> shouldn't say. Yeah, <laughs> Why shouldn't the public know? Well, there's an advance warning so the staff can prepare. If you do that, you start the wrong bit of the wrong game. But so the so staff can prepare immediately, so that's also to stand by in case it's a false alarm for that huge check. It's, it, it's an interesting problem, because I'm not saying you're wrong, but it's an interesting problem when you tell people. If you study Piper Alpha, a lot of the people who did what they were told by the staff died. The people who did disobeyed the staff instructions to stay where they are and jumped, lived, or had a better chance of living. And it's certainly clear in the South Korean ferry disaster that those who did what they were told by the staff. So I'm afraid I tend to rather trust my own judgment than <laughs> sometimes on the staff's judgment, if I'm not say. Um, so in complex buildings, to make them safer, what we've got to do is to have informed professionals as early as possible in the design stage. And that doesn't necessarily mean fire engineers, it means that the designers have got to be informed. So they will ask the right questions. They will know the limits of their knowledge. 
In other words, they'll know when to stop thinking they know the solution. And they will act as professionals. And to me, the definition of a professional is someone who tells the client what is in their best interests, even if it disadvantages the professional. So to tell the, the client that, in fact, this isn't a good place to build your hospital because it's too tight a site, or whatever. Uh, or as we did, we're not prepared to act as fire engineers on that hospital design because you want to put that over that and it's not safe. You actually tell the client what is in their best interests, even if they don't want to hear it. Turning to existing buildings, um, we've sort of come to the conclusion now that as long as we have a risk assessment, everything's safe. Risk assessment's good, therefore safety. Now, I'm not decrying risk assessments. They're an essential part of any safety culture. But the key thing is the risk assessment must be done by the right person. And that normally means not by a professional. It's done by the person who, who understands the building, who owns it. The Rose Park disaster in Erdingston, which I mentioned, they had the risk assessments, and they were awful. And they had paid for them. Um, and they weren't understood, and anyway, if they had been, they would have been awful. Um, I have been to a number of buildings um, with HSE, uh, when I accompanied the specs on visits, and we were shown the risk assessments for this process or this activity. And they've clearly never been opened. There were beautifully bound volumes of risk assessments, which the general managers tell us they had paid a lot of money for, 14, 15,000 pounds for. But they didn't use them, they didn't apply them, they didn't own them. So you've got to have a risk assessment, ideally done by the people who control the building, and if not, at least understood by them. And then you've got to understand what the assessment is. An assessment compares something against something else. Now, is that an assessment against a benchmark? And if so, who has set that benchmark? Or is it an assessment against another assessment? This is safer than that. So you have to understand to what level you are making that assessment and against what you're making that assessment. And I'm quite cautious about that now. So, if we're going to improve public perception and understanding, I want to pull it back to the idea that we have to be honest about what we know and what we don't know. We have to stop telling people that little simple things like fire extinguishers are going to make them safe, even if they don't know how to use them. We have to be simpler, and we have to stop concentrating on meaningless accuracy at the other end. Uh, I can well remember uh, when I was working for Scottish Building Standards, talking to, pe talking to people who had measured travel distances down to the last centimetre. And you think, that's nice, it doesn't tell me anything. If any of you know the Overgate shopping centre in Dundee, it has a curved mouth. And I can remember a long argument between two professionals involved in that one about whether you measure the travel distance down the inside or the outside of the curve. Because one made it legal and the other made it illegal. Did it matter? And anyway, if I was running, wouldn't I run in a straight line? If they haven't put a cost of coffee in the middle of something. Um, meaningless accuracy. Um, fire is not an easily predicted thing. And it doesn't matter if you're only right to a certain factor. As long as you've got the basic area right, it doesn't have to be 28 decimal points. And we really need, and this is a plea to the sort of fire engineering profession, to drive out those who are, who are inculcating this idea of sort of meaningless accuracy. What I, what I would call a necromancy. That somehow there is a mystical science of fire engineering and if we study it hard enough and long enough, we will get the perfect solution and the perfect numbers, and everything will be all right. Because that is a false belief. Architects detest add-ons. They detest having their beautiful building wrecked by having fire doors put in, or escape stairs built on the outside. But the solution to that is they should have had them from the beginning, not 
to make them more easily added at the end. Um, one of the buildings I studied for my own PhD was a, a, a secondary school in Hampshire, where um, it was really nicely done. Um, but you said, why have you put all these extra fire escapes onto the reverse side? <coughs> And they said, oh, well, when we use it for beer festivals, and you think, no one had ever planned that, no one had ever thought about that, but they were using this large double height central map for beer festivals two or three weekends in the summer, and that meant they needed more fire escapes. It hadn't been thought through, they had not really uh, taken it from the beginning. So, I would conclude that my hypothesis is proved, and what really makes buildings safer is not add-ons of little bits of fire safety, but more informed designers at an earlier stage. And I think that you can take that wider to almost any technology. You need to be, to remember the limitations of the science, to minimize the impact of legislation or the need for legislation. Legislation is not the solution to a problem. It can be brought in later, but you really need people to be doing this without the legislative stick. <coughs> you want to be aware of the meaning of I've said, and I think you want to challenge people's misunderstandings of risk. You want to be asking the question, are we sure that we can get out of that, of that um, airport terminal if we need to quickly? Are we sure that collecting five or six hundred people into a single area where we can search them is such a good idea. It may make the searching process slower, sorry, quicker, but it does give you a very large target. You know, Northern Ireland, you would split up, but you didn't pull people together because of that risk. I'm going to stop there, I think, because I have spoken for 55 minutes which is as much as I can expect anyone to listen to. Um, I apologise for not encouraging more discussion during the process, but I'm really happy now to develop some of those thoughts and ideas if people would like to. Thank you very much. Thank you.